but it was uh, one of those deals where I couldn't be here every day and had some appointments, and so that was a lot harder to do with coach a group when you're not here every day. For you, with it, with it, how it, did it help you maybe in your recovery just be able to be involved still? But how did that help? Did oh, that absolutely. It was very, very good to be involved. To, you know, be able to come to work. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I tell people, for me, is uh, that's been my therapy. You know, to be able to come to work every day and be around the players, the coaches, and and uh, it, it really gets your mind off your issues and your problems that, that I'm going through. And so this has been a great therapy for me. What was it like watching Demico go through last season's first year? And oh, how well it, he did it, it was it was awesome. And it, what, it wasn't a surprise that you know I I knew I had Demico coached him in 2006 as a rookie. He was drafted from Houston. And I know immediately after about a month being around him that you know he, he was going to be a special player, and uh, got some special talents as a leader, uh, and so that's it's not a big surprise that what he's doing and, and he's he he's such a sharp guy, leader, uh, a lot of energy, understand people, so you know the sky's the limit for him. He's going to do very well, and you know eventually he's going to be a head coach. Did you see that in him? Back in well, in uh, 2006, I remember as a rookie, uh, him coming in after about, a, I bet about three weeks, three or four weeks of him being in the building, the players used to call him Cap. Cap. You had, uh, I think, in a statement when the Niners announced you, you at least had to step away last year, you talked about wanting to be open about this and, and maybe, you know, I don't know, being able to help other people. Yeah. You know, cancer patients or yeah. whatever. Did, did you get a response or have you been able to have a lot of interactions with, with others and, and felt like you were able to connect with them? Uh, absolutely. You know, just, you know, almost every day I, I run into somebody that uh, they didn't have cancer, somebody in their family had it, and just to encourage people that uh, uh, this is a, a disease that that's out there, but you, know, you can overcome it. And, uh, you know, the main part of it, I, I think it's a, it's a mental part of it that you have to overcome and, and just to encourage people that there, there are brighter days. Uh, it's, a, it's a rough ride now, but uh, yeah, things does get better. And so that was, you know, I, I wanted to use my platform that wherever I can, that if, if you know, someone in need encouraging and help from this, I, I'm here. You know, I was, it's a it's a difficult deal to go through, and it's a, a shock probably for me, myself, families, and so I can imagine when people hit it with cancer, or what they're going through. So, and it's one of those deals almost that if you hadn't been through it, it's hard to explain it. You know, I've I've learned so much in the last three years, two and a half years, by going through this that uh, the strength that you have, uh, the encouragement of positive people being around you, uh, the difference it makes, and, uh, and, and you know, thinking about your future. You know, how, how, how I'm going to overcome this, and what's my, my plan, you know? So that's, and it's been a, I've been having a lot of prayers and people just faithfully praying for me, and, and but there's a lot of other people that is going through the same battle, and, and I just want to be in a position to help. When, when you're a rookie and you got that blank slate and, um, you know, you're just learning everything for the first time, you know, um, you take really big jumps. But then, you know, you become a player but player at the caliber of Nick. You know, it's there's just a small, minute details within your craft, you know, just uh, just continue to work on pad level, inside hand placement, leverage, perfection with his hands, his feet. Can I take a, a millisecond off of a rush and turn a, a hit into a sack, you know, a, a sack into a sack strip, a game change, changing type play? So it's just little small things um, that you got to continue to work because if you don't work it, you know, you're never going to improve at it. You know, you constantly got to be improving in the NFL, even the top players like Nick. So it's the small things, small details. You know, one of the things that a lot of fans would complain about last year and years past is holding, holding calls that go. Uncalled, I guess. Yeah. Is there any <laughs> any way to 
change that or like is different approaches? I mean, I mean how, do you, how do you tell him? Does he get frustrated? I think Nick's kind of answered the question multiple times for y'all. We can sit here and cry on our spilled milk or we can, hey, do everything we can to not let him hold us. That's my, that's, it's not in our hands. That call's not in our hands. Right. Uh, you know, the, obviously there's times where I feel yeah. like, uh, you know, that the, he should get a few holding calls here and there, but, you know, can't sit, sit, out, sit around and pout about not getting a call, you know, line up, play the next snap, um, do everything we can to not let him hold us. No, I, I look at your defensive line group, and, I mean, it's a deep group, and it's pretty clear that not everybody can make it. Is that a conversation that you even have with those guys that, you know, if you can't make it here, you can make it somewhere else, you know, try to just stay in your lane and control what you can control? No, um, not so. I, I think um, it's pretty clear in the NFL that if you play well enough, you know, in preseason games and you put your best foot forward, that there's probably always going to be a place for you in the NFL. I, you know, I'm just up front with them, you know, right from the start. I'm just telling them, hey, guys, we are always looking to acquire as many talented players as we can up front here. That's just, you know, the, the nature of, of the business here with the 49ers. We believe in the strength in numbers with our D-line. So when we see talented players that we have a, a chance to, you know, acquire and bring here, then we're going to we're gonna jump on opportunities to always add talent up front. So if you're sitting here counting numbers and worried about how many guys are sitting in the room that are really talented, you're worried about the wrong thing. You need to worry about putting your best foot forward and being the best you and working your butt off to, to carve out your role within the, the, the grand scheme of things. So they know that we're going to add talent, you know, so it doesn't catch anybody off guard when you feel like we already got a stacked unit and the next thing you know, we draft a, a Drake Jackson, you know, and so it doesn't, no one's calling on the phone saying, you know, I oh, feel like we already got enough. So they, they know that we're always looking to inquire talent here up front. We want, we want a deep group. You know, we feel like you're always going to need a lot of D linemen through the course of the year. Um, and you want to be able to put talented players out of the, out there when the time comes when you need them. So that's kind of our philosophy, you know, starting with John and Kyle and um, kind of what brought me here to the Niners, their envision for what a D-line should be. Yeah, you, just, you know what I mean, guys, are you, how much of it is you going to Kyle in the front office saying, hey, I like this guy, and how much is it them coming to you saying, what do you think about this guy? How does that the great part about um, here with John and Kyle and the way they have things, they have things structured, it's a collaborative effort. Um, Scouts, all of our scouts, our pro scouts, our college scouts know they can pop their head in my office. If, if, if I tell them, if you see a guy that you, know, you feel is talented enough to play here, always bring it to me. And let, hey, let's sit down, let's watch him. Um, you know, and then when we have, you know, our draft meetings, you know, uh, everybody's on the same page. Everybody's kind of uh, knows what skill sets we look for, and it's a um, pretty well oiled machine when it comes to look, looking for the talent that we want to acquire. Um, our scouts do a great job. Uh, John, you know, and, and his staff do a great job of, you know, one, you know, trying to identify the talent that we're looking for, so we're not wasting time, you know, looking at, looking at guys that we know can't play in our scheme. So it kind of streamlines it um, from the top down, and it, and it makes makes my job easier as you know as the year goes on, and you know, you've got you know a certain amount of players that you got to look at, and you know that you're not going to be popping on a tape, you know, wasting a lot of time looking at a guy that you know you can watch five clips on and see that he can't play for us from a, from a, a skill set talent standpoint. So you're universally regarded as one of the best, if not the best, defensive line coaches in the game. Do you want? Do you aspire to be a coordinator, a head coach, or is D-line your passion? D-line's my passion. Um, it, you know, when I was younger, you know, I, I conceptually I always kind of want to know what's going on within the defense, just so you know. When I'm watching, you know, tape on our defense, uh, you know, I can see where breakdowns happen and who should be in gaps and you know what coverages we're in. Um, but uh, my eyes are always drawn back to the front. You know, when I was younger, first three or four years in the league, I took every single note I could possibly take on coverages and all this stuff. And then I'd be taking notes on coverages when I was watching the D-line. <laughs> and so, my, you know, I'm, since I was in middle school, I've always put my hand in the ground, something I have a passion for, and something that I really don't see changing. We did get into one right, right there um, early on, and it was glaringly obvious um, to the point where some teams were just throwing the ball, obviously, you know, 
that's what you deal with if you can't find it. So, I mean, I think a little bit, a, a way more emphasis on that piece of it, and then taking some emphasis off. I remember, you know, Kyle said that one. I think it was that week. What was that after Indy? It was after Indy, right? Yeah, and he's like, "Hey, man, we're just going to do that because that's what I told him." He's like, "Hey, man, we're going to just got to throw it downfield." And then get used to those guys and getting used to it because that is a skill in itself. Just being able to run with your back to the ball and then pull around and find it and not constantly run into guys. And it's just it's an explosive play every time it happens. So, uh, super proud of the players in that process of doing I mean, to your question, like, at least we slowed it down. We still can be better. Yeah, I've been in that scenario a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, how do you feel about just the, feel great. the death? Yeah. Yeah. That was, we were making that comment the other day. Uh, just that practice, you got money out there, email, AT. Um, demo, I mean the whole group, and then take a peek over there, and then you notice Jason Brett. Oh, that's right, we've got JV over there still too. So, it's uh, like any position, the more depth you got, it always makes you feel better. And then when that depth is like good depth, and you know you got guys that can play. It goes back to your other question about him, and you got some more options on who plays where. Um, so yeah, very fortunate about that. But with the guys that you ended the season, with, and then and Ambry, you could have made the argument that you guys could have kept them as starters without, you know, eating the other, you know, without Shavier or Gordon. Guys would still be a better sure. team because they're. For sure, on the rise. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the uh, the fact that um, At I mean, he earned he earned that opportunity there uh, as he kept coming through the season. We know he didn't play in 2020, so I think that gap. I know I feel like we talked about that last year when we did this. Um, that's a long time when you sit out a year, COVID or not. Um, and so once he got up to speed and got to the point where he was playing fast enough. Uh, and then to be able to go out there in big games and play in big games, that was more that, that was more important than probably anything um, for him and his growth. Like you're saying, so now I mean, we definitely feel like he's on the rise. And then now you add more competition, and competition is only good for everybody. You know, you got a bunch of guys in there that can play at a high level. How do you massage his ego? How do you how do you deal with the guy? How do you communicate with him when he finishes the season? pretty good and mm -hmm. now he's going to have to really work his butt yeah I would say I would go into my office and I'd show him all the plays that he wasn't that good and be like hey man just, just so you know we're, we, we got a lot of work to do here and he knows that and then just like you do no matter who's in your room we'll rotate those guys through everyone's got an opportunity, an opportunity to play and then when we get to the end of training camp then we'll figure out I mean, that's really up to them not up to me. Everybody's going to get the same amount of reps, and then we'll see who ends up walking away with it at the end. You know? He's in a. I think he's in. He's in a great spot. He understands all that. Second half last season, that's a key message to him in terms of helping guys out or helping you out. And what's that been like this offseason since he can't get out the field? Guy's special. I mean, he's been in every meeting here in phase three, um, doing his rehab, and I lean on him a lot. Guys played a lot of ball. Um, his IQ was off the charts. Um, we were having a discussion in the meeting room this morning about a certain thing. And I, he, Jason asked me a question. And I said, I'm not going to answer that question. How about you answer that question? How do you see it going down? Um, and then he can give that answer pretty close to what I would I would say. But um, gives a different perspective for the whole room. I mean, guys are complete professional. You wouldn't even know that he's not out there. It's awesome. Uh, yeah. What's your plan for him, just as far as yeah, acclimating him back in? Yeah. I mean, is, um, is there a like, will he have the opportunity to be a week one starter? Um, I can't answer that. I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that that I would go, I would have to go talk to the trainers and all that. I know that I would bet against it, uh, but I have no idea how that's going to go. He's got a long way to go. I think he's going to tell you the same thing. Yeah. Um, and then we'll just take it day by day, see what happens when we get to training camp, and then uh, the trainers will tell us, hey, man, he's ready to go, and then he's ready to go, put him out there.